This is Steve again, and it's time to update one of my more popular Glacier National Park videos, because a lot has changed since COVID. As you know, Glacier is my favorite national park, and I've been to most of them. I've produced several videos on the park, including a two-hour epic that shows all that this park has to offer. The purpose of this video is to help you get the most out of your trip to my favorite park. Because there are challenges with accommodations, weather, bears, and crowds. But for many, the biggest challenge is navigating the ever-changing vehicle reservation ticket system. During the summer between 6 a.m. and 4 p.m., you can't get on the going to the Sun Road or into much of the park. I couldn't get a ticket, so I didn't even... Oh, then make, turn, make it right here, sir, about the size. Unless you have a hard to get reservation ticket. In case you haven't seen my other Glacier video, I'll start by telling you what Glacier has to offer which is a lot. And for the first time, I'm also gonna tell you what it's like to visit the park when the Sun Road is not open. Turns out, it's a great way to avoid most of the overcrowding problems. Up to three million people visit the park, even though the park's historic lodges and even its main road are only open in the summer. The lodges on the west side of the park open in mid-May. The east side lodges don't open until a few weeks later, usually in early June, and they tend to close in mid-September which is a couple of weeks earlier than the West Side Lodges. The only road across the park, the famous Going to the Sun Road, is only fully open when the weather allows, which is usually from late June through mid-September or maybe mid-October. It really depends on the weather. It's a beautiful drive in a car, on a red bus, or even on a bicycle, which have become very popular, in part because you can also rent an e-bike here. There are also mountain lakes, waterfalls, broad valleys, wildlife, including bears, and of course, glaciers. You can see them all in a boat, on a horse, and of course on foot, which is my favorite. The over 700 miles of trails make Glacier the Hikers National Park. There are trails for everyone, even if you're in a wheelchair. If you're a backpacker, Glacier has great multi-day hikes, but you'll have to reserve a backcountry permit for those. Most of you have heard of the Appalachian Trail, but did you know there's also a Continental Divide Trail? The 3,100-mile trail begins in Mexico and goes all the way to Glacier National Park and then on to Canada. A few of my favorite trails in Glacier are actually a part of this monster trail. You can also see the park on a boat. Tours are available in most parts of the park, and there's one in Waterton Lakes, too. I've been on all of them, and they're a nice way to relax after a long hike or perhaps on a day when you need to let the blisters heal a bit. And yes, you can bring your own canoe, kayak, or paddleboard, but it must be inspected before you put it in the water. They want to make sure that the invasive zebra mussel species doesn't ruin these lakes. In the park, it's big, but there's only one road across it. It's the 50 mile going to the Sun Road. Many come here just to drive it, often too many which has forced the park to create a reservation ticket system. Now I'm going to tell you about the five areas of the park and how to get to them. The Sun Road connects a few of the park's activity areas, from Lake McDonald on the west side, to Logan Pass in the middle, and Rising Sun and St. Mary on the east side. Two Medicine is in the southeast corner. It's near the historic Glacier Park Lodge. It's about 70 miles from Apgar on the west side, via Highway 2. My favorite part of the park, Many Glacier, is a 30 to 40 minute drive from the east entrance of the Sun Road and the town of St. Mary. If you bring your passport, you can also explore the adjacent Companion Park in Canada. Okay, now let's start talking about getting here. I assume most of you will be flying in. I've been to the park 19 times going back to 1994 and I tend to use the cheapest airport which is rarely the nearest airport in nearby Kalispell. Few airlines fly into it and seats fill up quick. So I've only used it a couple of times. I did check on it in June of 2022, and the cheapest rental car in Kalispell was $262 a day. I decided to fly to Seattle to see some relatives before making the long drive to Montana. I've also flown into Great Falls, but my favorite place to fly into is Calgary, at least when there aren't any COVID issues. It's only a three and a half hour drive to the east side of the park, and there's interesting sights along the way, 
like the head-smashed-in buffalo jump. It has the added advantage of being close to Canada's Banff National Park. And if there's forest fires or another calamity in Glacier, then you can just head up to the Canadian Rockies. Though it's very crowded and hard to get reservations in, too. Pre-COVID, about 3 million people visited the park, and the vast majority of the people do it in the three- to four-month window when the Going to the Sun Road is open. That's up about 50% from 10 to 20 years ago. I was here when Al Gore visited in 1997. I hiked to Grinnell Glacier with his group. By the early 2000s, media reports claimed that all of the glaciers in the park would be gone by 2020, prompting millions of people to come here before they melted away. Well, the glaciers are still here. And the Park Service had to remove signs like this one. The end of COVID restrictions have made the situation even worse. Rangers have to close parts of the park for hours due to lack of parking. And this forced the Park Service to implement the reservation ticket system. I talked to a ranger for about 10 minutes about the problem. We are trying to determine the best way to manage the traffic flow into the park to match that up with the infrastructure that is available. And the recurring theme was that this is a pilot system that is constantly being evaluated and updated. So visit the website often to stay up to date. But here's the state of things for now. In the summer between the hours of 6 a.m. and 4 p.m., you need a reservation ticket to drive the Sun Road in the Kamas entry station. On the west side, the ticket checkpoint is about a mile before the main gate near the park system office. If you don't have a ticket, you will be directed to a parking area where I met the helpful ranger who told me I had to turn around. Before the Sun Road is fully open for the season, you don't need a reservation ticket on the east side of the park. But when the road is fully open, the checkpoint on the east side is at the Rising Sun Boat Dock. In my June 2022 visit, the Sun Road wasn't fully open, so I didn't need a ticket on the east side, and I was able to drive all the way up to the Jackson Glacier Overlook, which is where the road was closed for the season. So how do you get one of these tickets? Well, if you're lucky enough to have a reservation to stay in the park, that reservation will serve as your Sun Road reservation ticket for only the day or days of that reservation. And as you might expect, the legalese gets a little tricky. But it also says that a reservation for a boat tour, a tour bus, or even a kayak rental will also serve as a reservation ticket for that day. By the way, the tickets have your name on them, and you'll need an ID that matches that name. So you can't buy and sell the tickets. If, like most visitors, you're staying outside the park, well, then you'll need a reservation ticket, and there's a couple of ways to get them. Most of the tickets become available months in advance via a special National Park Service website called recreation.gov. You have to create an account with them first before you're allowed to buy a ticket for a particular day. And each ticket is only good for three days. So if you're staying for a week, you'll need another ticket or tickets for the additional days. They haven't announced when the 2023 tickets will become available, maybe in March of 2023. But whenever it is, they will sell out quickly. And if you don't get one of these early release tickets, maybe you can't plan that far in advance, well, you have a second chance. Each day at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, a varying number of daily tickets are released at 8 a.m. on the recreation.gov website. They're good for the next day and the following two days. And by the way, the tickets for the Kamas Road to the North Fork, they're only good for one day. The number of tickets released varies with weather and recent crowd and traffic patterns. On my last minute June trip, I did not have a reservation ticket. And I was staying at my favorite place a few miles west of the park. There was good cell service there. But I like to get an early start every day. So I decided to drive to a spot near the checkpoint and get my ticket right at 8 a.m. on my phone. I was at Apgar when I tried this. I had cell service, but no internet service. Turns out I should have stayed in my room, which is five to 10 miles west of the park, where there's better cell and internet service. It was raining hard, so I decided to drive to the east side of the park on US 2. The 270 mile round trip was well worth it because the weather was pretty good on the east side. And that's another important lesson. When it's raining on one side of the park, head over to the other it's likely that the weather is better over there. 
And here's another tip. In the off season, when the road isn't fully open, heading east has another advantage. You don't need a vehicle reservation ticket to enter the Sun Road, and you can drive all the way to the seasonal closure point, which is usually at the beginning of the Alpine section. The next day, I tried to get the reservation ticket from my motel room. I started the process just before 8 a.m., but I didn't realize that you first had to have an account with Recreation.gov. So that took a minute. By 8.02, the day's tickets were already gone. I learned later that they are often gone in 20 seconds. In August, I tried again. Over 900 tickets were available at 8 a.m., but apparently I wasn't the only one trying to get a ticket because I kept getting this message after each of several attempts. But I kept trying, and eventually I got my $2 ticket. I checked back just to see how long they would last, and by 8.19, mountain time, there were still 39 tickets available. So there's hope for those who can't make their plans in March and April. So overcrowding is definitely a problem, and your plans in the park need to be flexible. And by the way, this is all subject to change because it's part of a pilot program, so you need to become familiar with the park's website to get the latest information because things can change at any time. These days, the crowd and transportation pages are particularly important. For hikers, the trail status page is very handy. It tells you if a trail is open and any related trail safety info, like is a bridge out, or if bears are in the area. If you're planning on camping or driving to another part of the park, you'll find the park's general info or dashboard webpage useful. It includes info on campsite availability, parking lot closures, which are usually due to overcrowding, as well as parts of the park that have access restrictions. It's a good idea to look at this page for a couple of days before your trip to get an idea of when overcrowding shuts down a place that you want to go. And there's also weather info. Okay, you get the point. You need to visit the website to learn lots of stuff, including how to get a vehicle reservation and how to get in the park without one. As I write this, you can get in the park before 6 a.m. and after 4 p.m. without a vehicle reservation ticket. And on my June trip, I did both of these. Dawn in Glacier, it's special. And it should be experienced even if you do have a vehicle reservation ticket. This is Dawn on the West Side. This is Dawn on the East. And now let's talk about the trails. My other videos cover the popular trails in great detail. Here's just a little something to whet your appetite. If you're going to hike the trails, you should download the trail maps for each of the activity areas. And if you can't do that, four of the maps are available in a pack at ranger stations and individually at the front desk of most of the park's lodges. The backs of the ranger maps have some useful safety trail information too. The trail distance information on the maps isn't quite as easy to understand as I wish it was. So you have to do some math to figure out how long a trail is. If you're online, you can scroll down below the map to see the total distance and some other info, like how hard they think the trail is. At the top of each map, there's a list of all the trails, along with the net elevation gain of each. By the way, I think the elevation info on these maps is more accurate than some of the other numbers you'll see on the website. Day hike trails are concentrated in five areas. The Lake McDonald area includes the Apgar town site. It's near the west entrance where most people enter the park, so it can be a bit crowded. There's lots to do here even without hitting a trail. For example, you can rent a kayak, and after you pull it for a little while, you can paddle in the largest lake in the park. You can also rent a bike and even an e-bike. But by the way, bikes and pets are not allowed on any of the park's trails. There's also a backcountry permit office here. The base elevation is the lowest in the park, and most trails are below the 6,900 foot tree line, so they're well shaded, which is handy on hot days. This is also the only place I know of in the park where you can rent a can of bear spray. It's about $10 a day. Normally a can will cost you about 50 bucks. Massive fires in 2017 and 2018 burned about 30,000 acres in this area creating dangerous conditions and early seasonal closures. And that's always a possibility later in the season. 
There is another west side activity area called North Fork. It's a dusty 30 minute plus drive, some of which is on a single track gravel road. It has lots of tree line trails, and some of them connect all the way over to another area called Goat Haunt. This is a remote part of the park, and there's not a lot of parking. There are Finger Lakes, Forests, and Pole Bridge Mercantile, and it's remarkably good off-grid bakery. Goat Haunt can only be accessed from a trail or through Canada's Waterton Lakes National Park, which is Glacier's sister park. If you download the entire map of Glacier, well, Waterton is attached to it. There's a little section above the border, and that's Waterton Lakes National Park. It has some great trails like Crip Lake, which is spectacular. And of course, you'll need a passport to go there. And the view from the Prince of Wales Hotel? Well, that's pretty good too. The St. Mary map includes trails along the east side of the Sun Road and at Logan Pass. Here you'll find easy access to waterfalls near the Sun Road, hikes to high mountain passes, and the popular trails at Logan Pass. Two Medicine is in the southeast part of the park. From the time the park opened in 1910 until the going to the Sun Road was completed in 1932, most park visitors arrived by train 10 minutes from Two Medicine in the nearby town of East Glacier, which is the home of the historic Glacier Park Lodge. The Two Medicine parking lot is small, and when it's full, you're turned away. But that makes Two Medicine less crowded than other areas. And some say the best trails in the park are here, like the Dawson Pass to Potemkin Pass Trail. If you take the boat, it's a 12-mile loop with a lot of elevation gain, but also some of the best views in the park. There are also short, easy trails, ones less than a half mile long, to a waterfall. And there's also boat tours and a campground. Many Glacier is in the northeast part of the park, which is my favorite. It's about a 40 minute drive from the east entrance of the Sun Road. And the view from the famous Mini Glacier Hotel is one of the best in the park. The nearby motor inn and cabins are some of the most affordable in the park. Mini Glacier is also where my favorite trails are, both easy ones and hard, including my favorite, the Grinnell Glacier Trail. It ends at the foot of a receding glacier. Mini Glacier also has activities for non-hikers, or for those who need a rest day, like taking a boat tour or riding a horse. Because here is one of the two places in the park where a vendor offers trail rides. The other is near Lake McDonald. But here you can ride a horse to Cracker Lake. It's one of the bluest in the park. Most day hike trails are out and back. But there are also some loop trails and some one-way trails that require transportation back to the trailhead. A free shuttle can help with that. Well, that's the day hiking areas. You can also do multi-day backcountry treks with a permit. Now let's talk about safety. Before hitting a trail or even driving the Sun Road, you need to know what to do if you encounter wildlife, and a bear in particular. There are both black bears like this one and grizzlies like this one in the park. But there's also moose, goats, bighorn, and the odd mountain lion. Once, there was even a porcupine under my Swift Current cabin. And you gotta remember that this park is their home. And you never know how a wild animal is going to defend it. Never approach any of these wild animals. Even if you're not gonna hike a trail, you need to read the park's info on bear safety. For legal reasons, I can't really describe it here. All I'm gonna say is that it's very important for you to know how to be safe out here. I've hiked hundreds of miles in the park, and I've never seen a bear near me. Hey, bear. But I always follow the rules, and rule number one is make noise. I have been close to goats and moose on trails, and even they can be dangerous. So please educate yourself, and maybe buy a can of bear spray when you get to the park, as it's not allowed on most airlines. But I know that many people come here just to see a bear. Those are usually people who haven't seen anybody mauled by one. But if you want to see one, you should know that bears and other animals like to drink in the lakes and streams in the early morning. This bear was not far from St. Mary Lake along the Going to the Sun Road. The hiker shuttle is free along the Going to the Sun Road from St. Mary to Logan Pass. And on the west side, it's free from Apgar to Logan Pass. The west side shuttles run every 15 to 30 minutes. 
but they only run every 40 minutes from St. Mary. Express service to Logan Pass starts at about 7 a.m. The regular service doesn't begin until 9 a.m. And the last bus leaves Logan Pass at 7 p.m. And you don't want to miss that one. Of course, these times are subject to change, so always check for yourself. And remember that there's no cell service in the park. Well, there's a little bit. Apgar generally can get it. But the rest of the park, you're not going to have any connection. I've heard that you can get some coverage if you have T-Mobile near St. Mary's. But the bulk of the park has absolutely no cell phone coverage. And yes, there's Wi-Fi in the park lodges, but it's very slow and, frankly, intermittent. Don't count on it. Because of size restrictions on the Sun Road, the shuttles are small, and they only hold 12 to 20 people, and they're often full. So you may have to wait for a second or even a third bus. During peak times, hour-long waits are not uncommon. There's another way to get around, and that's with a red bus. They have both shuttles and tours. They tend to operate only when the lodges are open. The red shuttles can take you to and from the train station or from Apgar to Lake McDonald. The red bus tours are a great way to avoid parking problems. They offer several tours throughout the park. Some of the longest ones cost over $100. And these tours fill up quickly too, so it's best to book in advance. And there's one more tour company. The east side of the park is on Blackfeet tribal land. The relationship's kind of complicated. The tribe actually has control over its own borders. They lease the land to the U.S. government. And to learn more about this, you might want to book one of the Blackfeet tours. They offer full and half-day narrated tours from the Blackfeet perspective. You can't do all the great trails in the park on one trip. And any trail may be closed for any number of reasons. So here's a list of my top tier hikes. First, of course, is the Grinnell Glacier Trail. The Trail of the Cedars is number two, followed by the Highline Trail. And that means just about any version of it, including my lunch spot. The Tarbingen Tunnel, Saya Pass, Bullhead Lake, Crypt Lake, and St. Mary's Falls are all hikes that you should do at least once. But if any of those trails are closed, or if some of them are just too hard for you, these trails are on my second tier of great hikes. Iceberg Lake. Grinnell Lake, Pigan Pass, Swift Current Pass, Dawson Pass, Virginia Falls, Hidden Lake, Avalanche Lake, Abacuni Falls, Fisher Cap Lake to see the moose, and Sperry Chalet. There are likely plenty of other nice trails out there that I haven't done, and I hope that you'll tell me about them in the comments. Let's talk about trip planning. A plan is important, but keep in mind that Glacier is not a theme park. Nature's plans may not coincide with yours. So first, plan for flexibility. Bear activity can close trails and campgrounds. Weather is unpredictable and can change quickly in the mountains. Forest fires can utterly ruin your plans. In recent years, my annual trip has been canceled twice because much of the park was on fire. And smoke from fires, even if they're hundreds of miles away, can make hiking and even breathing difficult, and for some, dangerous. So in planning a week to 10 day trip, I plan for at least one bad weather day. Your plans will also depend on if you're staying on the east or west side. Remember it takes two to three hours to cross the park on the Sun Road. Keep in mind that those who are in really good shape have many more options when it comes to doing trails. I prefer nine to 10 day trips, but most people stay for less than a week. So the itinerary I'm about to describe is for a seven day stay. Let's say you arrive in the afternoon. So on day one, get to know the area. Read over the park info they give you when you enter the park and ask a ranger or hotel staff if any of the trails are closed. Ask where there have been wildlife sightings. Then explore your local area. Ask other visitors what they've done that they really enjoy. And take a short walk or hike just to see how the altitude is affecting you. Remember the east side elevation is about 5,000 feet, and that's about 2,000 feet higher than it is on the west side near Lake McDonald. For dinner, or perhaps after dinner, visit one of the park's historic hotels, even if you're not staying at one. Many areas have ranger talks each night near a campground or in a hotel ballroom. In many glacier, a ranger sets up a spotting scope in the swift current parking lot each evening. You may not be lucky enough to see a bear, but there's almost always something on one of the mountain ridges. 
And of course, you don't have to do all of these things on the first night. You've got six more. Whatever you do, don't just hang around in your room. It's far too beautiful out here. Rooms are for sleeping and writing in your journal. That's how I get the base material for these scripts. Unless I get to the park really early on day one, I use my first full day in the park, day two, to get used to the altitude and maybe do a short hike, but most importantly, that's the day I take a bunch of pictures. Drive to going to the Sun Road or take a bus tour to another area of the park that you haven't seen. And if you're lucky enough to get a parking place at Logan Pass, stop and look around. You never know what you might see or photograph. But please remember, these are wild animals. Don't try to take a selfie with them. If you feel up to it, take an hour or so to hike out to my favorite lunch spot with its great view of Heaven's Peak and the valley below. On the Sun Road, when you come to Sun Rift Gorge, stop and take a look at the gorge and maybe walk down to Bering Falls. It's not far. And don't miss one of my favorite photo ops in the park, Wild Goose Island Viewpoint. It's just a few steps from the Sun Road. Glacier is a great place for photographers and Instagrammers. And of course, remember that the east side of the park is lit by the sun in the morning. And the west side of the park is lit in the afternoon. And also remember, there is no phone service in most of the park. So instead of just taking a selfie, why not take something that's suitable for framing? By day three, it's time to take a real hike. One of my must-do hikes. For first-time visitors who are physically fit, here is a list of my must-do hikes. Number one, and my favorite hike in Glacier National Park, it's the Grinnell Glacier Trail. This is one of the few trails where you can actually walk up to a glacier. Number two on my list is the Highline Trail. From Logan Pass and connecting with the Swift Current Pass Trail, all the way to Many Glacier. Now number three is a tie, so I'm kind of cheating here. The Tarbigan Tunnel, Saya Pass, or Crip Lake are all very nice hikes. And they're also a little bit more difficult. But there's also an easy one on my list, number four, Bullhead Lake. So on day three, if it's open, I suggest you do the Grinnell Glacier Trail first. It's my favorite hike and it's not too difficult. It takes me two and a half to three hours of hard hiking to get up there, but I'm taking photos and videos at many of the beautiful spots along the way. And remember, this one is three miles shorter when you take the boat. For many, this is a tough day, but it's one you will never forget. Day four. If you're tired and sore, maybe with a blister or two, you may want a day that doesn't have quite as much up as the Grinnell Glacier Trail. So the Highline Trail, which is up to 15.2 miles long, might be a good option for you because it has only about 800 feet of up when you go all the way down to Swift Current. The 15.2 mile version from Logan Pass to Many Glacier, well, it takes me about eight hours. Now, if that's too much for you, consider just going down to the Loop. That's only 12 miles long and it has only 330 feet of up, but you'll need the hiker shuttle to get back to Logan Pass. Both routes go down about 2,300 feet and remember that hiking poles make descending much easier on the knees. If either of those routes are just too long for you, consider just taking the two to three hours to go out to my lunch spot and back. It's a great hike, and because it doesn't take that much time, you can do another trail, like Hidden Lake. Okay, now we're at day five. After two relatively hard days, I plan for an easy one, and Bullhead Lake is perfect. It's an eight mile round trip that feels relatively flat, they say it goes up and down about 400 feet, but really you can't tell. Day six. Well, since yesterday was a pretty easy day, it's time for another tough hike. So this would be one of my number threes, the Tarbigan Tunnel, Saya Pass, or Crip Lake. Any of these trails will make for a very memorable last day, but these hikes should only be done by people who are in really pretty darn good shape, because these are pretty tough. If that doesn't include you, well consider doing one of my second tier hikes, like Iceberg Lake. On day seven, getaway day, get up before the sun to see Glacier at daybreak. I do this nearly every day to capture images and get time-lapse sunrises. Glacier looks incredible at dawn, and everyone should experience this at least once 
stopped when they come to Glacier. If I don't have to leave until midday, I'll also try to do a short hike before I leave. The Falls hike from the Sun Road. The Trail of the Cedars on the west side. Or maybe even a jaunt out to my lunch spot if I have to cross through the park. Basically, take in as much as possible. I haven't said too much about nighttime activities because, well, this is not a party park. The big lodges have fine dining and a bar. And unlike your room, it has a TV. The towns west of the park have many more options. But I'm usually asleep as soon as I'm done taking my notes. But if there is a clear sky, I highly recommend that you step outside and look up. The altitude and clear sky means a city dweller will see more stars than they've ever seen before. It's even better when there's no moon. The number of stars is incredible, as is the Milky Way. If you're really lucky, you may even see the northern lights. If you're a young couple, remember that the walls in these old hotels are very thin. And the sunsets, they're not bad either. So what do you do if the weather is bad? Well, first, come prepared. Bring Gore-Tex versions of everything from shoes to hat and gloves, and hike anyway. On one of my first trips to the park, I spent several hours on one rainy day just hanging out in the Many Glacier Hotel, the ever-changing view out the large-scale windows. In the warmth and smells of the fireplace made for a remarkably pleasant day. Well, for several hours anyway. And remember, the weather can be quite different on either side of the park. If it's raining on the side you're on, check with a ranger or hotel staff to see where it might not be raining. On more than one occasion, I've just driven to another area and done hikes over there. Forest fires are a bigger problem. I canceled a couple of my recent annual trips because of large fires late in the season. Bear activity can also cause trails and campgrounds to be closed. Remember, this is not a theme park. Mother Nature is not your mom. And like your mom, she has no favorites. But nature isn't the only thing that can hurt your trip. Glacier has become a victim of its own success. Crowds have made travel and especially parking a big problem. And you can see the parking lot status on the website. And remember, you can also find road status information on the website. Too many cars can cause rangers to close road access to popular areas of the park. During the busy season, the best way to enjoy the park is to start early. Popular parking areas are often full by 7.30 in the morning, as you can see on the dashboard if you check before your trip. And trailhead parking also fills up early, and you will get a ticket if you park where you're not supposed to. Another way to avoid the crowds is to avoid the busy season. I've made a recent trip in early June and another in early October. The weather wasn't great on the June trip and many of the trails were closed due to snow and flooding, but there was still plenty to see. I had never seen Lake McDonald flooded or McDonald Creek raging. The rain has other benefits too. The long drive to the east side was worth it and it's always fun to see a bear. I got lucky on my October trip. I was there for peak fall color. Sure, there were a couple of cold mornings, but there were more pleasant afternoons. By now, I hope you understand why Glacier is my favorite park. And if you don't, check out one of my other video travel guides. I bet they'll convince you. For many, Glacier is a once in a lifetime trip. But for me and countless others, we keep coming back because you just can't experience everything this park has to offer on one trip. But I hope this video helps you plan yours. Please give it a like and subscribe. This channel is dedicated to helping you explore the West because it's big. Thanks for watching and come on out to Glacier, my favorite national park. And I think you'll agree, this place is special.